What's good everybody, I'm Keandre, this is Hoopin' Elect, and welcome back to the channel. Now a lot has been going on in college basketball lately, and a lot has changed since the last board that we did, and even since the last mock, just given how long those take to make. So it was time to give an update, and I also just have a lot to say about certain draft topics, so um, now felt like a really good time to do that. Now the series of back, which will hopefully add some context, and even though a lot will change throughout the rest of this year, I am confident in these being the main majority guys at this point in the year. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into it go get you a snack get you something to drink and we'll start with some of those right outside the top 60. so it's a nearly impossible task to kind of stop it at just 60 players so for the most part these guys are in that same general range as those in the 50s i think adem bona has been really good in the new year and then he's got teammates like jaime Hawkins, jalen clark and amari bailey who are all still in the mix as well i think donovan Klingon out of uconn is draftable i'm not sure he declares this year but he's been super productive in low minutes as a 7-2 big who can really block shots eric Gaines has made him Impressive progress shooting better than ever and finding a balance next to Jelly Walker and obviously he's still an insane athlete Isaiah Wong and Matthew Cleveland have been on fire and then you've got guys like Alex Fudge also Iguodaro Trace Jackson Davis who I've grown to like a lot then the rest of these names whether it be a Kobe Bufkin Amore Abram or Tyrese Proctor I think they've got real NBA potential it'll just likely end up being in next year's draft but we will see and I'm also giving Bob Miller some time to just show us what he's got I think he could potentially still be a first round pick but he's looked really raw so far so i just want to see a little more in this setting before i can feel fully confident in that but yeah a lot can and will change but those guys are still very much in the mix now starting off that top 60 i still like mojave king as a complimentary wing at 65 i think he has a good chance of fitting in a lot of places he plays hard he can knock down shots he moves well without the ball he's got professional experience it's definitely worth a look in the second round to me I talked about this recently on the mock draft, but some of the turnovers and lack of real presence starting in some of those December games were kind of unconvincing for Coleman Hawkins. However, he remains an interesting prospect as a 6'10 forward who can defend in multiple spots and do work on a perimeter on offense. Arthur Kaluma has been somewhat trending in the right direction with his energy and using that athleticism to his fullest abilities. I still think he's got a ways to go in terms of decision making, turnovers, and playing within the flow of the offense, but you can see the talent there as a wing who can get a bucket and defend like he's capable so he's got to stay in the mix to me Georgia Tech's Miles Kelly has emerged as a real draftable guy this year. He's a knockdown shooter at that two guard spot who has shown he can do some good things attacking shifted defenses and making simple reads out of the pick and roll. He's someone I could see playing another year and further developing physically to make a first round run but I like him this year too. Now Dylan Mitchell has terrific defensive potential, he's a supreme athlete, but there's no real area to count on offensively, he won't shoot it, and it's just pretty limited on that end right now. I still think he's worth a look in the second, but I still don't quite understand the first round buzz beyond familiarity with his name. Jordan Walsh has really struggled offensively lately and it probably makes most sense for him to return to school though there is still a whole lot of time for him to right the ship. If we can get him to be more assertive and comfortable on offense, limit fouls, and knock down a few more shots I think he can get there. He is one of the most talented defenders in college right now and I think has first round potential next year. One of the draft's most impactful guard defenders, Reese Beekman, should find himself an NBA home come June. He's improved pretty significantly as a shooter while maintaining that steady and connecting presence as a playmaker. I think he fits in a lot of spots and it's good to see him fight through the injuries and still perform. One of the hottest draft topics out right now, Grant Nelson kind of took the basketball world by storm for a second after KJ Pistons made that video on Twitter. Shout out to him. And I think it's hard to deny Grant's skill set, but he is still pretty raw. You watch him against Kansas and Arkansas and New Mexico, there's a bit more of a gap there offensively, and to me, he's more of a project. But the skill set is there as an energetic forward with great defensive potential, the upside to turn some of those crazy flashes offensively into something more real, especially if he can improve as a shooter he just generally makes smarter decisions but there's an nba guy in there for sure and those flashes are big time Azulus Tubelis has been balling and really putting it together as a junior at Arizona. He's a serious threat inside who showcased great touch. He can shoot the three and has improved as a defender this year. Right now, I think he's a mid to late second round type of guy, but every time I watch him, I feel like that might even be too low. 
Providence's Bryce Hopkins has emerged as a real threat in the Big East and a guy I'm sure Kentucky wishes they still had right now. He's kind of a tweener wing forward whose motor is always running and has been able to score it in multiple ways. The defense is what I'll be watching most the rest of the way but his slashing ability and workable shooting has been intriguing and made Providence a pretty fun watch. Now, I'd expect some of those players we talked about outside of the 60 to end up in here and some freshmen throughout the second round to return. On the next one, I'll maybe try to project that out to some extent, but I do like these players and the separation between them and the next handful isn't too significant. Moge is one of the best bigs in the class. That type of athleticism and fluidity matched with the ability to protect the rim, make passes, and the improvement he's shown as a shooter, especially from the free throw line, make him someone who should be a real commodity, likely anywhere from the early to mid second round. Tucker DeFreeze recently dismantled Bradley in convincing fashion going for 28. The defense is going to be key for him, but I think if you refine his role, get him as a second side guy, a spot shooter, he's going to shine within that. The off the balance and creation stuff may not be there at the next level, but to me, he's too nice to not at least get a real shot in the league. Starts there to set the screen. All the way in reverse. I still think JJ Starling is a draftable prospect whose value probably peaks next year. He's continued to show off his self-creation ability and well-rounded athleticism. I still would like to see him take some steps forward as the decision maker and three-point shooter, but that quick combo guard skill set is definitely there. Cross midcourt, gets a shot up there. Kansas State's Naquan Tomlin has been a huge surprise this year and a super interesting NBA prospect. He's a 6'10 forward who can put it on the floor, is bouncy, and has high level potential defensively. And he is older and does have some strength still yet to gain, especially in the core, but I think he's a real NBA guy as a late bloomer and he's someone that you should keep your eye on the rest of the way. Now, Julian Phillips hasn't had a ton of success offensively, but I still like him as a prospect long term. He's got great size and athleticism on the wing. He can be a high level defender. He can run in transition. And I think if we get more of the Mississippi State Vanderbilt type of performances with him taking advantage of just those easy opportunities and knocking down shots within this Tennessee offense, that'll be a big win for him. Duke's Derek Lively is having about as rough a season possible for a prospect ranked that high, but I do still think there's a draftable prospect in there. He's actually been pretty good defensively, both protecting the rim and sliding his feet in space. Duke isn't doing him any favors offensively, and he's also not shooting a three ball like we thought he might. But as that defender and play finisher, I do think there's a contributor there, despite what he's done so far this year. James Najee is another guy that you obviously got to do a little extra work in watching as he plays for Barcelona. He's been really good as of late. He's not the flashiest prospect, but as an energy big who can defend in multiple spots and finish at a high level, the appeal is there. And how high you take that, I guess, depends on your team. But I do think that he contributes in the league eventually. Jalen Wilson will likely find himself on the All-American list for helping lead this Kansas team to a great record in season so far. He's taken on that lead man role and just ran with it recently giving K-State a near 40 ball. He's improved, but I don't think he's quite the shooter or defender that makes you extremely confident in him taking on that lower usage role in the league. But he is a very solid second round selection and should contribute at some point. If you just look at the box score, you're probably not going to be too impressed with Andre Jackson, but if you watch a UConn game, it'll be hard not to see his impact immediately. He's a terrific athlete, a high level defender, and a very good playmaker, but the shooting in half court offense is the thing that's going to swing a lot for him. He's made a lot of progress and earned himself the right to be drafted, but that'll be the difference on where he falls on draft night. I've changed my mind on the money baits a few times, but I think I've settled into him being an upside swing in the second round. He's a big time shooting and scoring talent, but the struggles to fit into the framework of an offense and really contribute to winning when his shot isn't falling give me a lot of hesitations. He's still in that top 40-ish type of range because I think he's got the gift to get buckets in a unique way, as tough as they might be, but that's where I'm at at the moment. Gets Maddox, pulls up. 
Keontae Johnson has been one of the best stories in college basketball coming back from what was a scary collapse a few years ago when he played for Florida. It's been hard to rank him for that reason, but until we have concrete info of that heart condition being like a lasting issue from this vantage point, we got to rank him more appropriately. He's been a leader on one of the hottest teams in the country as a physical wing who can get to the basket, is shooting it at a high level and can make plays defensively. He's obviously an older guy, but I think he's worth a high second, all things considered at this point. Brandon Podzimski has been a great transfer story going from Illinois to Santa Clara and really shining. I like his potential as a lefty connecting guard who has good feel and does a lot of things well. He's not the quickest or most athletic but he makes plays and can get you a bucket. And whether it's this year or next I think we see him as a real draft guy at some point. If you've been following the channel, you know I came into the season last year with Mike Miles as a top 35 guy. A number of factors kind of kept him off the board, but I think that he's here to stay at this point. He's currently leading TCU to a great season. He's improved leaps and bounds in terms of efficiency and two point percentage. He's a better passer than the assist show he can defend, and he's still just 20 years old. Marcus Sasser continues his good play as the lead guard on one of the best teams in the nation. I think he'll look better and more consistent in professional settings, but I'm just not as confident in him as a shot maker or passer to have him first round, especially being a six foot guard. But I do think he's a really solid player in that top 40 range, and he should be one of the main characters of March Madness, and we know what that might end up doing to his stock. There are times that I watch CD Sissoko and say that there's no way that he's not a first round pick and others I'm just not as big of a fan and his ability to make an impact on the game just isn't there as much. But I do still like his potential as a connective guard, someone who can make plays for others, has really good size, can knock down a three. And if he can put it all together, especially defensively, I think that he'll have a good chance of making an impact in the league. I think we probably jumped the gun on Julian Strother to a degree. Would have been amazing for him to take that creation leap, but that's just not his game. With Corey Kispert, I've gone 15th and got all of those accolades playing with this team, as opposed to Jalen Suggs and Andrew Nimhard, you'd be kind of crazy to say yes. Point being, I think Strother's a solid complimentary player, a really shooter, has good size on the wing, in that early second, late first type of range. Ricky Council making a leap both in terms of his play and in SEC basketball has been a sight to see. I think if he was a more consistent shooter or was just cleaner mechanically, he'd be a real first round type of guy, given the type of athlete, driver, and finisher he's been this season. Regardless, he could hoop and honestly with Nick Smith out, he's kind of got to be the star every game for Arkansas to stay afloat offensively. Terrence Shannon Jr. started off the year really hot and then for a while there it started to feel a bit more like the starts that he had in previous seasons at Texas Tech. But at this point I'm pretty confident in him being a late first early second round type of guy. Forget the shooting, his improvements as a ball handler and passer alone are enough to earn that. He's a really good athlete and he'll be key in getting Illinois back on track in Big Ten play. Driving inside. Oh. This tier has a really good amount of talent, many of which have shots at getting into that top 30 range and cracking the first round depending on the team picking. I've recently been able to check in on Tristan Vucevic playing for Partizan Belgrade and I've been impressed. He's had some inconsistent minutes but it doesn't take long to see his capabilities. He's cashing in on the shooting potential he's had, he can put it on the floor and make plays for others, and has looked a bit better defensively than I remember in past seasons. I really enjoy watching Kobe Jones hoop this year and I think that that will continue in the NBA. He's really improved across the board most notably as a shooter and a bigger experienced guard who can do a little of everything lest the game come to him and finds a way to make an impact is a good one to make a bet on in this late first early second round type of range. Syracuse's Judah Mintz has consistently been one of the most effective guard creators in college. He's been great at making something out of nothing, hitting that pull up and dishing it off. He's going to need to shoot the three, that's his biggest swing skill right now, but when you look at what he brings on offense plus the activity on the other end within that zone, he's got to be a potential first round guard in my opinion. Nikola Jurisic has started to hit his stride recently playing some good basketball and leading Mega to some wins. He's a really solid wing prospect who can shoot it, handle it some, and make plays for others at a list is 6'8". He's still 18 playing professionally and has some injuries to work through, but I think he'll still find himself in first round talks. 
Leonard Miller is still in that mid to late first round range to me. I know he was kind of pitched as more of a ball handler and initiator. I don't know how much of that he's going to do in the future, but he's done a really nice job at contributing, finishing off plays, handling from the elbows and in those horn sets, knocking down a few jumpers and still competing defensively. He's a bit of a project, but super young and already performing at a high level in the G League. and should probably get a little more attention than he has to this point. Jordan Hawkins remains one of my favorite players in the class and someone I like in that first round range. He's a huge part of UConn's offense because of what he can do as a shooter and the attention he attracts in the process. He can put it on the floor some, you definitely want to see more of that. And I like him defensively, especially as he grows physically over time. It's hard to describe just how good Deron Holmes has been this year. We knew he was a breakout candidate, but this is far beyond what I thought he'd do. He's a great athlete, finishing plays at a high level, putting up big dunk numbers while also protecting the rim and defending his space at a high level. And right now I view him as a first round guy. Kyle Filipowski has been pretty easily the most consistent player on this Duke team. That's convinced me of his NBA prospects over the course of the season. I think he's a better shooter than the numbers show. He can put it on the floor and make plays in different spots. He's been better than I thought he'd be defensively. He's a first round pick. Jalen Hood Shafino has earned a right to be in the mid to late first round in my opinion. He had a pretty slow start to the year, but since like the UNC game, he's been tremendous. The shot is working. He's been really good with the ball in his hands with some injuries going out. And while he's not the biggest downhill threat, he's got terrific potential as a connected guard. And is someone who defends at a high level as well. He's just a really good player that's hard to miss when watching Indiana. NC State's Terquavion Smith hasn't been very efficient as of late, but he remains a much improved player from a year ago, primarily as a finisher and decision maker. I'm still letting things play out, but I don't think he quite has the game or physical profile to get into that lottery group. He's probably more of a six man microwave type of guy, maybe gets into that starter range, but that's a valuable role and I really like watching him play. Alabama's Noah Clowney has been a real riser for me this season, and the best way to describe him is just versatile. He can knock down threes and attack closeouts, but also sets good screens and finishes well at the bucket. And defensively, he's shown that he can defend in space, block shots, and while he's far from a finished product, and I think that should be mentioned a lot when it comes to him, he's the archetype of player that every team covets, and as young as he is, he should settle in as a first round pick. Wow! I'm not 100% sure what to do with Kalel Ware at this point. He hasn't played over 15 minutes since the start of the new year. Still a very intriguing prospect who had big time games against teams like UConn, Michigan State, and Villanova, but he's just simply not playing right now behind Nifali Dante. Regardless, a seven footer who is as fluid as he is, can block shots, can shoot the three and finish lobs, is a first round pick to me, despite the limited minutes and some of his struggles in terms of strength and, and finishing off possessions. Ryan Rupert has recently returned to the court from a broken wrist and he's looked as good as ever. I still really like him defensively, he's a slithery driver, there's reason to believe in his shot long term, and he's doing all of it in a good pro league at 18, and I feel like it should get a little bit more attention. You're not going to find many people that are bigger fans of the Murray twin story than me, and especially with Chris. That slow grind from unrecruited to prep school and just working his way year after year at Iowa has been amazing. He's continued to do numbers consistently being one of the best players in college basketball and showing he's a real NBA talent. There's a definite spot for a versatile forward who can hit threes, put it on the deck, and be solid defensively like he can. Now in a draft full of high level rangy forwards and wings, UCF's Taylor Hendricks belongs in that conversation along with them. He's continued his high level impact, he's continued his high level impact in conference play being a big time athlete who can defend multiple spots, shoot the three and put it on the deck when he needs to. He's cooled off some from deep but I love his fluidity, he's a little undisciplined but the talent is there and he's a guy I'm confident in belonging in this range. I really like this tier, it's still pretty loose, but I think a lot of these guys should stick in the mid to late first round mix. Now the last few that we talked about and into the next tier is where the lottery talent starts for me. The order is still under construction, but these are the names I'm most confident in.
starting with Derek Whitehead, who was quickly moving in the right direction, but then took a couple steps back. But I think he's firmly in this range and a potential lottery pick. And I wouldn't blame anyone who still had him in that top 12 ish range, just given what he did in high school and pre broken foot. I'm still being patient, but at some point, I would love to see him show a little more of that burst and explosion, especially to finish at the bucket and as a creator. It's hard not to see the potential with Gigi Jackson as a 6'9 shot creating wing who also happens to be the youngest guy in the class. He's still very much a top 10 type of candidate for me, but at the same time I think there are reasonable concerns in his abilities to fit within the framework of a good team. And it's been a lot more evident in conference play where he's shooting under 30% from the floor and has had a tougher time getting the spots than earlier in the season. I think we'll find out soon where it makes most sense to take Gigi. Bryce Sensabaugh is a high level scorer at a legit 6'6", 235, and I think he belongs in the lottery range. He's got some things to work on defensively, I think he's been better but still a work in progress as a playmaker, but he's been about as efficient as you possibly could be, and has been able to get a bucket on basically anybody on any spot on the floor. Grady Dick's impact has gone far beyond the box score in some of his recent performances. We know he can shoot it at an elite clip, he can make plays for others and do a little off the bounce, but the crashing the glass for extra possessions, taking charges, making that extra pass is the stuff I really like to see from someone who will be a high level complimentary guy at the next level. Obviously there are a ton of different options at every pick, but in a vacuum every team could use a guy like Grady on their squad. I really like Anthony Black. I think there's a spot for him to be really successful in the league, especially if it's next to a dynamic scoring guard or creator. But I am still a bit concerned about him as a shooter and just as a perimeter scorer. I think he's done some terrific things when he's got an angle downhill and is assertive. And I also still love him defensively. There's a top 10 caliber guy in there, but in this log jam of prospects, the shot is the deciding factor for me right now. He's got Mignon on him. There he goes. Right to the I still think Kaysen Wallace can be a game changing defender who has proven he can knock down threes pretty consistently, which at the very least that combination is an easy lottery pick. But I still have some concerns with his half court offense and just him as a creator at the next level. Now he's been the lone bright spot for Kentucky for most of this season and after seeing Ty Ty get 50 in the G League, I might just start blindly betting on Kentucky guards regardless of what I'm seeing, but regardless I know he's going to be a high level contributor and that means a lot. Jarris Walker is growing more and more comfortable offensively and I'm starting to really buy the flashes on that end. He's in a much different situation than most prospects playing on a team like this Houston one but when you combine what he can do defensively at that size with the passing flashes and again some of the stuff that he's done as a self creator and shooter over the course of the season it's someone I would be willing to bet on being able to show a little more in the league. Pepperdine has struggled a lot more than I thought they would this year, but Maxwell Lewis is still pretty solidly a lotto guy for me. He's continued being an all-around threat at 6'7", and someone who's shown that he could do it against a team like Gonzaga, even through the foul trouble. He can play off the ball, he can do a little off the bounce, he's a good athlete. He just makes a ton of sense for the modern NBA with a game somewhere between like Devin Vassell and Trey Murphy. Nick Smith Sr. recently said on a radio broadcast that Nick Smith Jr. would return at some point this season and I really hope we get to see it. He still showed off that ability to score the ball at a high level but, but at the same time it wasn't a ton of games. He looked a little sluggish, the foot speed wasn't all the way there but I think in the grand scheme of things he's still got to be in that top 10 convo but at the moment it would be hard for me to keep him in that sort of top 5 range right now. Jed Howard just recently had one of the best prospect games of the entire season against Iowa. The three point shooting was on full display. He showed off that upside as a self creator as one of the more interesting movers and shifty guys in the class at 6'8". And I think we should start viewing him as more of a top 10 lock and someone who could be in that top 7 range more than like that fringe lotto guy he's often been. I've grown more confident in Keontae George's game over the last several weeks. The scoring and shooting is coming along in a real way, he's been living at the line and even though you'd like him to be a bit more efficient from the floor, I think he's got the it factor. He's still not the burstiest guy but he's creative with the ball in his hands and on top of all of that, I love him defensively and as a passer. And He just makes sense to me as a guy I know for certain will be a good compliment and has the upside to go even higher. George. 
Now Brandon Miller has been putting together a tremendous freshman season, a 6'9 lights out shooter who can make a few plays off the dribble and in the pick and roll, and is solid defensively is pretty much a lock to be a high level contributor in the league. And to add to that, he's been finishing at the bucket at a much better rate recently, which is great to see. Now, when we start calling him Paul George or describing him as your go-to guy in the league, that's where I get a bit nervous. I just don't think I've seen that guy in terms of burst or separation, not only in the UNC Arkansas Houston games, but the 30 ball games as well. He's well in the top five convo to me, but that's my one gripe with how he's been described at times. I really like Cam Whitmore as this super athletic power wing who can defend and shoot the ball. I think my biggest questions right now would be his ability to make plays for others and his engagement level off the ball defensively, but everything else still has the makings of a top five and seven pick, and hopefully he'll be able to shine through what's been a very weird year for Villanova. Now the Thompson Twins still come in at number 3 and number 4, but I'm far from set on that being how it'll be by the end of the year. I do still have a lot of questions about OTE, just given we don't have anything else like it to reference and the habits that can come out of it aren't ideal. And they are older than a lot of the competition that they're playing, but with that being said, I still think they have some special traits that just don't come around often. Asar has been much improved as a shooter, he's got some stuff off the dribble in the half court getting to the pull up that put him in the convo for the best twin. Of course, combined with who he is as an athlete and as a defender and then Amin is about as electric an athlete as there is and he also happens to be about as gifted a playmaker that we see as well. They have their strengths and they have their flaws like making things too difficult at the rim which we laid out months ago in their videos but they're still well deserving of being in this area and hopefully bounce back quick after what was a subpar game in their first loss of the year last weekend. And this is that next tier outside of the top two for me. I've still kept it loose for now, but it does feel like those guys from three to eight are starting to separate themselves, but we will see how things play out and there is a lot of opportunities for those other guys to join them. And of course, Scoot Henderson comes in at number two once again. He's recently returned from injury finally and is back to doing his usual great things in the G. He's one of the best point guard prospects we're going to see. He has no true holes in his game. He's a terrific competitor and seems to always show up in the biggest moments. And what he's done professionally at such a young age is phenomenal. And he really is a trailblazer and should be treated as such. And honestly, I'm very comfortable not considering anyone else at number two. And then, you know, we've got Victor Wimanyama at number one. If you don't know who he is by now, I don't know where you've been at. He's about as special a prospect as we're ever going to see with his level of agility, the rim protection and defensive versatility, what he can do with the ball in his hands, the shooting upside. He's one of a kind and is going to have teams on the edge of their seats, palms sweating on draft lottery night for good reason. He's someone who could in one night help change the fate of a franchise. And so those looks are inherently going to lower the efficiency and there's the first. And here's a look back at the entire board. I appreciate y'all for watching. If you did enjoy, please be sure to leave a like. Subscribe if you are new around here and leave a comment down below of your thoughts on this draft class as a whole, some of your favorite players, you know, some sleepers, everything in between. I like reading the comments um, and seeing some of your guys' insight on some of these players. But yeah, that's all I've got for this one. I appreciate you guys watching once again. I'm Keandre. This is Hoopin' Elect. Till next time, I'm out.